Um, yeah, I think we may have a diminished audience because of next. Uh, there are at least some people that are regularly here will be there. Um, okay, uh, so I have three topics that I wanted to cover. The first is discussing the recent DVDs. So as I'm sure most folks here are aware, we had a uh, security release on Friday, and this covered two uh, vulnerabilities. One was related to path normalization and the other to headed matching. We were discovered at roughly the same time and had, in fact, it's at roughly the same area. They had the same sort of attack vector and uh, uh, threat model. They were fixed by the Envoy security team under embargo over a period of about two weeks uh, together with uh, various Googlers. And this was really our first run through the Envoy security release process. So I'm first of all happy to answer any questions about these vulnerabilities if anyone ha has any. Uh, and second, I uh, would like to sort of discuss how we move forward from here. And specifically, we would like to take process improvements. We're going to do a post-mortem. I've got a long flight back to uh, Boston on Friday, which I'm basically going to use to write up as much as possible. We have a doc for jotting down initial thoughts if anyone has any uh, to uh, share uh, based on their experiences during the handling of these vulnerabilities. Um, and I think we should probably set up a, a longer meeting next week uh, because we're always kind of time uh, cramped in this meeting to discuss some of the fallout from that. And I think some of the things we're going to want to do are, first of all, make various process tweaks and improvements based on our experience. Uh, this includes things like looking at, you know, what are our notification windows are going to be from with our private distributors from when we have a a, a candidate's set of patches for the fix till the end of the embargo period. Um, we would like to deal with some very um, Ombre community context specific things that include how do we sort of, who belongs on the distributor list and uh, you know, we're not regular shrink wrap software or even a distribution like Red Hat or something like that. We're uh, our own thing and we have both distributors and service providers and we have this tension between wanting to make the list larger to provide advanced notification to as many people as possible and trying to keep it small to try and ensure the embargo isn't broken. And we need to have like a pretty open discussion about that. And finally, um, we need to think about how we can do things like canarying and staging rollouts of Docker images where, you know, the Envoy sidecar binary is actually visible to other applications and potentially users of distributions um, in a way which doesn't actually break embargo and leak information. And I think these are all sort of like uh, deep topics. So I, I don't want to talk about them now unless anyone wants to say anything briefly about them. But uh, instead, I think uh, we'll schedule a meeting and share it with everyone for probably next week. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, uh, any other questions on security stuff or should we move on? Okay, uh, the other thing I wanted to do is just put in a plugin or an advertisement for a design doc, which I'll probably share in the next day or two. I, I have an internal version. I would like to just share this externally and that is um, uh, on the, what we call Orca open request cost aggregation. And this is this idea that Envoy is already capable of providing load reports to um, a low, uh, control plane load balancer via load report service. But in order to, uh, uh, it's also pop, the LRS or, always had fields there to support backend specific information. For example, not as Envoy's load, but to be able to channel things like the CPU utilization of backends or application specific metrics which are applied by backends. And this idea is that these flow either in bands uh, via uh, response headers from the backends, or they come in via um, uh, sort of a, G a gRPC service up out of band. And this allows the global load balancer or the control plane load balancer to make decisions based um, not just on envoys and um, it's, its own idea of what the backends look like, but based on actually the status is observed by uh, uh, envoys. Um, so we are hoping this can be sort of a standard which many different sort of application and microservice frameworks will eventually adopt and make available to envoy to facilitate this. 
But as a first step, we know that the GRPC LB folks who are busy working to adopt XDS are interested in using this for exactly this purpose. And so they're going to be driving uh, the initial implementation there. But I'll try to share a design doc and uh, we can see if uh, what changes need to be made. I don't think it'll be very controversial because there's only like so many ways you can really do this. But um, yeah, that's coming. So. Okay, uh, Matt. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to talk about the deprecation stuff again, specifically the host deprecation for the cluster load assignment thing. Uh, and then there's the other one, the deprecated TCP deprecated V1. I think that one is not, I think that the TCP deprecated V1 is not controversial. I just, I think we need to have a policy basically that unless there is an explicit replacement, we can't, we can't have something be deprecated. Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I rolled that one back with yeah. notes. I thought you also wanted hope, un, uh, sorry, host undeprecated as well. Well, that's what, that's the one that I want to talk about here. Um, and, and, and that one is more subjective, I, I think. My personal feeling, and I'd love to hear what other folks think, is that I, I don't think deprecating it is worth the pain, given how simple the transform is. Um, so, but this is, I, I guess this is just a general like policy question, which is, you know, like technically cluster load assignment is a superset of hosts. So, you know, if we keep with our, uh, you know, idea that everything is machine generated and there should be a simple transform, uh, you know, then we can probably deprecate host. It's just one of those things that seems so pervasively used that I just know that it's going to irritate people. Um, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't seem worth it. So I would be curious to hear what, what other people think. I guess my thought is I would prefer that we not have redundancy in the API long term, but I am 100% fine. Like, I think my preference would be to leave it flagged as deprecated, not make it fatal yet. So like not cause the pain and then see what happens with the conversations we've been having regarding kind of our general API refactors, which we'll yeah. have a better sense of in a couple months and bring to the community and get all the approvals for. So I think by next release, we'll have a better idea of what we want to do for reading. Okay. And delaying that pain until then sounds good. And then leaving it more okay. to Yeah, now's probably actually a good time to point out that uh, we are starting to think about how to uh, deal with the uh, long-term evolution of uh, Envoy's APIs and how to uh, better sort of deal with uh, major breaking changes and structural changes. Um, we'll probably have some sort of straw man proposal uh, coming shortly. And this probably would be best been for that one of these like major structural changes. Yeah, no, and that, and that sounds fi fine to me. I, I just know that if we make a fatal by default now, like we're, we're going to get a bunch of people complaining. Um, and it, yeah, it feels fine to me that if this would be the type of thing, and again, this is up for a conversation, but in our yearly cleanup or like whatever we pick that cadence is of like doing major cleanups this seems like something that that we could we could throw in there okay so i guess we're agreed so i guess my question Alyssa, then is i haven't been fully tracking how the scripts work is it the kind of thing where we run the script but then we can hand edit it or or like is it going to keep breaking because like we're not doing what the script Said. We need to hand edit it every time, but again, I think because we're just punting it till next release, and I think by next release we'll have an idea of what we're doing long term. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's terrible to one off. Okay, but but sorry, I just want to make sure that I fully understand. When we're hand editing it, we're going to commit what we hand edit. So when we run the script next time, like we would see it in the diff that it's getting moved back, and then we could discuss it then, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it'll it'll come back next quarter with the exact same question, and we'll okay. we'll hopefully by then have an answer. Okay, great. So I mean that that sounds good to me. So it sounds like we're in agreement to not make it fatal by default. We will leave leave the warning, um, and then we can defer our discussion until next time, basically. Yeah. Can, can we just add to the script so like um you know a whitelist of things that we don't want to uh, deprecate? We can. We already have it for part of it, but again, like yes, I can totally do that. Okay. Okay. But I don't want to because I don't think this is something we want to do. So I'd rather figure out what our plan is than hack the script to have one off workarounds. Cool. 
Um, if we're done with this, I did have one more comment on the security thing. Uh, or is there any other stuff that anyone wanted to chat about on the deprecation topic? Uh, okay. Um, just one thing um, related to what Harvey was talking about uh, is one of the things that we're going to be discussing, and this is not necessarily even for discussion now, I just want to put it in people's minds and for people who are listening to the recording later. Um, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is uh, like who, who gets to be part of the pre-announce list. Which is which is an interesting discussion, and there's you know there's a bunch that's already written in our existing security policy, uh, but there's been some interesting discussion just about how you know Envoy is not quite the same as other software, so trying to figure out who gets to be on the pre-announced list and how to keep that list useful but also not not so big um, so that it, it makes the embargo stuff kind of pointless. Um, so it's probably not something that we're going to discuss now. I just want to throw it out there for food for thought that if you have uh, comments or, or thoughts on, uh, you know, w what should the criteria be to get on the pre-announce list, uh, we, we would love to hear your feedback. So you can have public feedback or you can email the Envoy, uh, Envoy security list, whatever works. Yeah, in particular, if anyone's sort of aware of other open source projects which need to deal with this kind of thing where they're, you know, they have significant use, for example, let's say in uh, edge networking and cloud service providers or this kind of thing, or as uh, you know, cloud service providers, not so, yeah, like, you know, uh, just to give random examples, like people like, you know, eBay or Pinterest or Square. What does like uh, Apache do for the HTTP, HTTP server, right? That seems. Yeah. That's probably a good one to look at, so, or uh, Nginx and so on. We should, we should yeah. Look at what they do. Yeah, we should. We should. We should definitely take a look there. Um, yeah, I still think that we're going to be in a slightly different situation just because of the whole sidecar deployment model and like vertical product situation, which is a little different typically than Nginx and Apache. But I agree, it's definitely worth worth looking at those. Yeah, I, I think like the the the. the Sidecar model takes us closer to a regular distribution like Red Hat or something like that. Whereas the problem is we have distributors who themselves have cost, have uh, partners and so on, who then may want to provide early notification to their customers. And that's a, that's a much tougher dynamic to uh, manage. Yeah. Can you quickly review what you mean by like the Red Hat? Uh, Kind of bucket. Interesting, like you know, um, it, it takes us closer to being a, a component of a regular distribution when we have folks like, for example, Istio building their own products based on us. As you can think of Istio essentially as a distribution of Envoy. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, and the you know the the stance that we've taken so far is it, it's basically that. Anyone, you know, effectively building uh, a product or service clearly known and based on Envoy, um, who who is not just serving themselves. So, you know, so like Lyft would not uh, would not uh, be on the list. Pinterest wouldn't be on the list. Uh, eBay, et cetera, which is typical for how most of these lists work. But again, we're we're just trying to gather feedback. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, there are all kinds of ways this can be structured. I mean, we've had, you know, the, the, the point made that, you know, in the, for example, the Linux kernel community, to some extent, you know, the, your amount of contribution and uh, influence the community can, can impact how likely you are to see um, patches early. And is this a good model? Um, I think, but it is a model and an alternative to, for example, the one that we, we've, we've discussed. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I think again, we're, we're just looking for feedback. So uh, comments, thoughts, other projects to look at would be super useful. We also have a channel Envoy-CVE if anyone wants to do, uh, join that to discuss, that's probably a good place to have public discussion.
Cool. Anything else? I, uh, the, I, I, we're having a lot of CI flakes is um, like around coverage. Harvey, what's the status of the Bazel native coverage? <laughs> um, so it was blocked to me figuring out how to deal with plumbing of exter of um, various flags down to external dependencies. Now that we switched to rules foreign CC, there's a new version of rules foreign CC, which apparently fixes that situation. So I need to go in there and see if that uh, magically works. That does, then that unblocks one thing and then we can go back to the uh, original PR I had out. So um, I'm hoping to get to that uh, this week. But as far as I know, the native coverage fails on the uh, coverage report merger part. That seems a problem. I'm not sure if I follow the uh, right way. Uh, that that uh, what my local run from Harvey's pending PR uh, like uh, a couple of days ago. Well, a lot of the failures I've seen were with a G one specific GRPC test. Uh, so the coverage fa uh, coverage that uh, fix should be fixed. Uh, the GRPC test should be fixed in uh, uh, sixty two two nine. The remove CI workspace that one triggers the coverage consistently. And the cost is uh, one of the timeout is set to one second and it increased to 10 seconds. That should be good for now uh, for the coverage failure. I think that is like depends on how the coverage tests are the order to run and it was used to be work but not working. When some people add new tests and it failed. How does increasing the timeout uh, help, the, help the order? No, I mean the, the I mean the change in the order seems affect the whether that te test will fail consistently or how often that test is failing. Okay, we should we should follow up offline because I mean anytime I see a timeout like that, that that looks a little shady. We should probably make that use either the simulated time thing or or something else. Yeah, but that's a like integration test, like talking to a real uh, gRPC server with the. Uh, oh, code. Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. With it. a real network to local host. Okay. So, yeah. The only so the only reason that I brought up basal basal native coverage is mostly that no one can ever figure out how to run the coverage stuff locally. Uh, but, right. It, it was so it, it just it just seems like it would be you know like it would just make it easier for people to actually debug. Right. Right. It it, it was hard to debug that. That cost me like. Uh, a couple hours. So, yeah. I used to be able to run coverage locally <clears throat> and that seems to degrade um, for reasons I haven't figured out yet. It seems to be giving me errors which are just wrong. Like it's telling me things that are wrong with my build file that seem obviously right. I, I yeah. think the how to run coverage locally haven't changed it just the uh, run the harvest script still works. Yeah, that's the script I use for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I haven't, I haven't figured out if this is something in my environment or something that I've done to my object file directly. Mm -hmm. But um, and then CI, the timeout that I saw was an, not a timeout of a particular test, mm -hmm. but a timeout of the whole process, which I think might be related to how much code you have in the PR. Yeah. So I've I've seen that issue many many times now. Is that the one where it's like killing the basal thing, but like it, it, it times out doing that, or 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 did the build fail? Um, that one, I'm not very sure. I will, I will keep eyes on the, uh, runs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mine, mine timed out after like 2000, not for an individual test, but like 2000 seconds for the entire run. Which is okay. Long. All right. Yeah. We, we just need, we, we just need to keep an eye on it just because at least in the last few days, I've seen a ton of people like the coverage mm -hmm. test is failing constantly. Yeah. yeah, so one of that is the gRPC client integration test should be good for... Okay, all right. Uh, so yeah. I, I guess let's just make make sure that people merge mm -hmm. master. One, yeah. one, one idea actually that comes to mind, we should talk to Ite. I'm wondering if, like, if we know of a case when everyone has to merge master, I bet we could do something with the bot and, and yeah. actually like get the bot to go through all open PRs and just like say like, please, please merge master. Yeah, that, that, would, totally that would be great. 
great. Okay, let me, I'm, I'm making a note now and I'll email Ite because yeah, it's like, it's such a pain when this happens and like everyone just keeps running retests and it doesn't work. So um, I will, I will email him. Uh, okay, got it, M made a note. Uh, uh, am I still alive? Uh, I wanted to say one other thing. So um, I'm simulated time is probably not good for all integration tests yet. I'm, I'm kind of working on the background, but I, I shelved it because I was too busy with other stuff. Um, but there's still some uh, uh, semantic confusion around what that means, the way that it's used. And I have some in-flight code to try to clean that up. I just need to get it to work. Okay. Uh, but I think it's good for some integration tests and, and it should be good for any unit test if that helps. It's been, it's been great for me. Uh, it's, it's super fantastic. Cool. So I definitely recommend everyone use it. Okay, thanks. That motivates me to try and finish up the stuff that I'm doing and make it easier to, uh, to reason about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the stuff that we have to figure out is what you and I have talked about offline, which is just that in the integration test, we wind up in the situation where multiple threads are incrementing the time and then, and then it just gets like super complicated. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. Um, did anyone have anything else? Um, we're at next. Uh, some of us, uh, anyone else is around and wants to chat? Happy to. Hey, I was thinking if I could have a minute to introduce myself. Sure. Okay, so I'm Isma Pustinen. I work at Intel here in Finland. So I'm part of a bigger CNCF team here, which is trying to contribute contribute to CNCF projects, Kubernetes and Envoy. Our focus is sort of in this, like how to get everything running the best on Intel hardware, like accelerators and CPU features and whatnot. I'm myself particularly right now looking at this QAT support and so on. But the other task for our whole team is sort of to try to make these projects as like awesome as possible and help out everywhere we can. So, so I, I just want to thank everybody who has been reviewing the peers and and like talking on the on the issues which I've been finding. And I hope to kind of interact even more with you guys. Like like now going on. Well, wow. yeah. cool. Yeah. Sounds um, great. I yeah, I, I, I think you're, so you, right now you have PR, active PR around uh, the private uh, key uh, offload uh, capability in boring SSL, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I think uh, oh, I owe you a review for that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that today. <laughs> hey, thank you. Cool. Great. Going once. Hey. Nice. Uh, Sorry, sorry, just to jump in here. Uh, my name is Eric. I work at Instructure. Uh, we, we're adopting Envoy internally. Uh, we have an issue open about improving or making error messages machine parsable. Um, and we are also discovering as we're starting to develop with Envoy locally, uh, we have a lot of exception messages that are causing some of our developers pain. Um, and we're wondering whether it would be easier to just send in PRs to fix those error messages first and sort of push off the machine parsable uh, issue, which will probably take longer since we have to change a whole lot of exceptions, um, or if we should focus more on getting the error messages machine parsable first and worry about fixing the actual contents of the error messages later, if that makes sense. I think it's I think it's going to be hard to give guidance without having more more detail on on what type of things you're you're talking about. Um, so I would recommend either opening an issue with some of the changes that you're that you're thinking about, um, and then we can that we can discuss there. Okay. Yeah. So we already have that issue open. So we just continue commenting on that. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I just like better error messages sound good, but I guess I, it's hard to know. I, it's hard to know exactly what you're, what you're proposing without, I, I think a bit more detail. 
Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the real result is it's just the, the message isn't quite clear. And so it's, it's a question of, is it worthwhile to spend time uh, rewriting the actual message of the exception, like the string that gets thrown to the user, or if it's worth spending more time on making them, uh, you know, proto buffs so that way uh, they can be parsed uh, themselves. I mean, j j Generally, just changing wording can't hurt too much. I mean, it's going to clarify. I think that's yep. a no-brainer, but yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I would say like better documentation, better error messages are probably always, always going to be, uh, going to be approved. I, I guess the, the only reason I was asking to, to maybe discuss further is that I don't quite know what you're proposing. It's like, if, if, if the text is going to be controversial, then we might have to discuss if it's just like, obviously more clear then it's, it's probably fine. Uh, but, but without knowing the details, it's, it's a little hard to, to give guidance. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry to be vague. We don't, you know, we are, we're still very early in into this and we're still very much deciding whether or not this is worth pushing up, you know, globally or within ourselves. Uh, so I apologize for that vagueness. Uh, but yeah, that, that actually helps a lot. Thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, in general, like we really, really appreciate better, better error messages, better documentation. So feel, feel free. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. See you folks next time. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.